I want to talk about something that has sort of kept me busy and interested me for a while. It's a little bit of a footnote, I would say, and mercifully, architectural historians have really not dealt with this uh, story uh, very much at all. Um, and uh, it, it, I think, sheds a certain life on both the sort of uh, um, influence of the Woolworth Building, also, of course, on Roman urban planning in the 1920s, and finally, on the political standing of Cass Gilbert. And uh, as you can see here, on uh, September 30th, 1924, the New York Times carried a most astonishing headline. Uh, it said, Mussolini to build high skyscraper to rise 88 floors, 1,100 feet above Rome. And it pointed out that the building that was planned for the center of Rome here in 1924 had uh, a certain similarity with the Woolworth building. It also pointed out that uh, the architect who was very prominent in South America, in Buenos Aires, where he had built a number of buildings, was a fascist. And uh, next one, please. And uh, indeed, Mario Pallanti, uh, who uh, had been born in Milan in 1886, had studied at the Accademia di Brera, and then uh, when he graduated in 1909, his teacher Gaetano Moretti sent him to Buenos Aires to oversee the construction of the Italian pavilion at the centenary exhibition of Brazil in 1910, uh, which uh, Palanti did, and uh, he loved it there, and he opened his own practice and was quite successful and built uh, almost 100 buildings in Buenos Aires, and you see here a movie theater and apartment buildings, and most of them still stand in the heart of Buenos Aires. He was quite uh, uh, prolific uh, over there, and uh, the, uh, uh, also was a great, uh, brilliant draftsman, as you can see here in 1916, he had an exhibition in Buenos Aires at the Palazzo degli Belli Artes um, in 1916, a little brochure was printed with these images, and you see here he was concerned with uh, uh, monu funerary monuments that are integrated into some sort of alpine landscape and grandiose Baroque interiors. His probably most important building in Buenos Aires is the Palazzo Barolo. Next one, please. Uh, maybe I'll just give you little signals, that's uh, probably the easiest. Still very prominent in the skyline was the tallest tower in Buenos Aires uh, at the time, 1923. And as you can see here, it sort of morphed from an almost anthropomorphic Gothic uh, structure into a tower that had sort of slightly Indian overtones. And uh, the uh, view from the air shows you it's quite a dominant building. You can go up there and, and uh, enjoy the view over the city of Buenos Aires to the parliament, which is just down the street, is on the main thoroughfare in downtown Buenos Aires. And when he was, uh, this is 1923, when he was finished, he won the competition for another tall building just across the Rio de la Plata in Montevideo, uh, a tall tower with a hotel uh, inside, uh, uh, the tallest tower built in reinforced concrete in South America at that point, an enormous structure, also still stands. Um, and um, uh, Palanti claimed that he invented, he had invented something like a South American uh, Rascacielo, the South American image of the skyscraper. Clearly somewhat derivative of maybe South American Baroque, Corrigoresque Baroque in some details, but they're also curious little Indian uh, parts. It's a very strange building. There's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful story of how Corbusier, how Corbusier visits Montevideo on his famous trip to South America, and there's this great story uh, written up by his local friends and admirers, how he's in that big plaza, it's right in the heart of the city, in this big plaza in Montevideo, and Corbusier walks around and looks at that building which has just been finished, I think in sort of late 20s early 30s and he walks around and sort of positions himself in this plaza and people ask him uh, Monsieur Le Corbusier what are you doing what's going on and he says I'm trying to figure out where to put the cannon he said <laughs> But then something happened. He was uh, at the height of his success, Mario Palanti, and then in 1922, a little before these buildings, um, the March of Rome happens in Italy, and uh, he becomes a fervent fascist. He joins the fascist party, he gives money to an uh, uh, organization to support scholars in Rome. Uh, uh, in Argentina, it was quite a strong fascist movement among those exiled Italians. There were many there. You get actually, to this day, there are many Italians, of course, in, in Buenos Aires. You get wonderful pizza there. Uh, and uh, uh, he uh, becomes a fervent fascist and sends a book with his early work to Mussolini. A few weeks later, he receives a postcard from Il Duce, who writes to him uh, that he appreciates the architect Palanti and that he knows, Palanti knows, 
the Roman courage of construction. So <laughs> thus encouraged, Palanti uh, sets out to do his main work of his life, what he considers the greatest building of them all, and in fact begins to design an enormous skyscraper for the fascist revolution that he wants to uh, present to Mussolini, who he feels obviously appreciates uh, his work, and so he does a set of drawings and travels to Rome. And uh, here's the footprint of this enormous building uh, that he shows to uh, Mussolini. You see here already, it's very ambitious. It means to bring together all the elements that a big fascist headquarter might need, a hotel, sports facilities, several theaters, and assembly rooms. Here in the uh, semicircle up there is the big assembly uh, uh, for the fascist party. And so an enormous tower. And uh, let's look at the next one. And uh, apparently Mussolini is quite taken with it. He looks at the building and uh, uh, says, you can actually do an exhibition with all of your drawings in the Palazzo Chigi where he had his office. And if so uh, he does a few more drawings, stays in Rome, and in September uh, 1924 does stages an exhibition with all of these uh, drawings that he uh, prepares. He was obviously a very good draftsman. One could probably say that the New York Times was right, that there was a certain similarity to the Woolworth building. and. Uh, uh, one could also claim that instead of, it's a little curious, it's a skyscraper for Rome, uh, but instead of, uh, you know, we had heard that he had claimed to have designed a South American skyscraper style with his buildings in Montevideo and Buenos Aires, he didn't really resort to uh, uh, designing an Italian uh, skyscraper style. Rather, what we find is the echo of American skyscrapers of those early years that we've just seen, the Woolworth building, of course. Uh, also, one could uh, claim there's a little bit of the Singer building in there, and uh, maybe we can uh, look a little further. There's probably a little bit of the Equitable building in there, and maybe the Municipal building around the corner. So it's, it's all merged in there together. So. Uh, also, uh, a whole series of wonderful drawings show the very uh, ambitious interior design. As I said, there are sports studios and, and a huge hotel with about a thousand rooms and this enormous structure of 88 stories. Uh, there are rooms for the politicians, perhaps most impressively what you see here on the right, a gigantic steam bath for the senators that he uh, <laughs> describes in great detail. So, uh, next one please. Um, Mussolini comes to the opening of this exhibition which is in, in the building where he he holds his, has his office uh, and uh, writes in the guest book. He give, first of all, he gives the project a name, Per la Mole Littoria, the Littoria Tower, really. Uh, Alala, he says, Alala is part of that fascistic uh, battle cry that, that uh, Gabriele D'Annunzio had created for the fascist troops when they were running around uh, in the streets. They would uh, uh, call out, Ea, 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 Alala, to uh, encourage themselves to, uh, um, uh, uh, for their actions. And of course, uh, the Littoria reference is something that Mussolini would use a lot afterwards. His first uh, uh, founded city is called Littoria, as many of you know. It was the uh, um, uh, a bundle of branches that were carried in processions, uh, of course, coming back to Roman uh, customs. Um, uh, please, the next uh, slide. Uh, Palanti is a little vague about the position of this building, but he says, according to one newspaper, that it should be built right next to uh, Mussolini's seat of power in the heart of town, next to the Palazzo Chigi, roughly there where you see this red circle uh, stretching. And of course, it was so gigantic that the footprint would have reached from the center of town, from the Palazzo Chigi, all the way to the Tiber River. And so I uh, tried to imagine what this building would have looked like, and I asked one of my students, uh, um, to uh, make a little reconstruction for us. And Henry Harding was kind enough to do that. Let's, uh, uh, next image, please. <laughs> there was a little sound with it, too. You heard it in the beginning. Yeah. I think it's from Star Wars. The student <laughs> put it in. So you get the idea. And of course, I always wanted to know what would it have looked like from if you climbed the dome of St. Peter's, and that is what you would have seen if you climbed all the way up. You see here uh, Bernini's wonderful colonnade. And then I asked Henry, can, can we also try out and see what it would look like? Let's say you're in Rome in the morning and you go out on a Sunday morning to get a cup of coffee in the Piazza Navona, right? Let's uh, look at what it looks like. Here you go. Uh, so. So obviously, as you can imagine, there was a bit of a, a response to, the, to these plans by Mussolini. Uh, next uh, image, please. And I spent a lot of time in the uh, state archive and, and library in, with the microfilms in Rome. 
uh, which is quite, <laughs> quite an undertaking. You know, out of these 15 microfilm readers, there's usually only one or two that work, so you have to be there <laughs> early in the morning. So to, uh, and I looked through all the uh, journals, and it's of course, uh, after the press conference in October 7 and 8, they all mentioned the building, and one could really see how closely controlled each of these magazines was by the fascist party. Those that were very close to the fascist party would say, oh, this is a brilliant project and wonderful, and Mussolini has signed off on it. Others would be a little more critical and say it might not just fit into this uh, Roman landscape. And uh, so uh, that was quite interesting to see. Uh, next uh, slide, please. If we look a little further, of course, astonishingly, the New York Times only reported on the facts that you saw in the beginning as, uh, in this essay. Astonishing also that the little note on the front page of the New York Times appeared a full week before the press conference, after which all the Italian reviews and most other reviews came. So I have a suspicion that Palanti himself had, had notified the newspaper after uh, Mussolini had made his first uh, comment. Uh, many newspapers were a little more outspoken about their opinion, and the Woolworth building is often featured uh, in these uh, critiques. The Washington Post, for instance, writes on October 17, 1924, the construction of such a building would be a monstrosity in the city of popes and Caesars. It is questionable whether the American skyscraper should be made an article of exportation. It explained that they were suitable in New York, where they had finally evolved into a satisfying ensemble, but, and I quote, a Woolworth Tower or an equitable building throwing their shadows over St. Peter's and dwarfing by its bulk all the glories of the ancient city would shock the artistic feeling of the whole world. The Los Angeles Times feared that the skyscraper would be chafing Rome and imagine a monster building towering against the sky, more fearful and wonderful than New York's 58-story Woolworth building, but that Rome would be made more beautiful or really more impressive by its new possession is seriously questioned. Here's the Cleveland Morning Dealer where the uh, writer actually tried to pencil in the height of the Woolworth building right next to the tower and uh, it pointed out the height of Palanti's uh, building, obviously uh, 1135 feet, and then the paper wrote the Woolworth building in New York, the highest of its kind in the world, is only 792 feet high. The people of Rome, now inspired with that new spirit of progress and modern efficiency which, uh, with which Signor Mussolini has done so much to foster throughout Italy, are delighted at the prospect of beating America at her own favorite game of skyscrapers. And uh, the, just a few more foreign voices, the Deutsche Bautzeitung from Berlin, for example, wrote a long essay warning that this skyscraper in the heart of Rome would present an urban catastrophe and mentioned the destruction that had already been caused by the entire lack of scale in the Vittorio Emanuele monument. Now this skyscraper, the magazine argued, was a monster, a tower of Babel, a deadly sin against which the world's Christianity should revolt. <laughs> just, I'll just give you, uh, you know, many more, of course, as you can imagine, just here's Boy's, Boy's Life, which is the uh, magazine of the American Boy Scouts, and uh, they are not very happy with it either, or if we uh, look further, uh, next one here is Popular Mechanics. They also go on about how horrible it would be to have that in Rome. Here's Illustrated London News. They even um, uh, commissioned their wonderful draftsman Chester Bonestell to do this amazing graphic where you see the tower compared with St. Peter's and the Pantheon and and the Castello Sant'Angelo, etc. There were also many letters that were written to Mussolini, as you can imagine. There was one which I loved from a man, I forget his uh, name now, an architect from the United States who said uh, he was uh, president of the building managers of the nation in the United States and if Mussolini built his tall tower they would like to manage it for him. Um, so they sent a few brochures for the Duce to look at. One letter, however, one letter, however, came from a prominent American architect Cass Gilbert, next image please, who wrote to Mussolini on October 16th, 1924, as the architect of the Woolworth building, which with the exception of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, is the highest building in the world, and having built many other high structures, I can perhaps claim to have a little knowledge of them. And then he goes on to say, I have followed your career with the greatest admiration and I believe in you and what you do, he writes to Mussolini. No one has arisen in our time, and especially since the war, whom I so greatly admire. I do not say this to flatter you, but in all sincerity, so that you may realize 
that it is in no spirit of criticism that I write this letter. And then he politely expresses his concern that the tower would impair Rome's beauty and distinction and suggests that Mussolini might, and I quote, reconsider the whole subject and ask his architect to design some other type of structure which will not be excessively high but in harmony with the beauty of Rome. And he makes a very concrete proposal, and I quote, a majestic colonnade or the completion of the approach to St. Peter's, for example, so that the vista may be obtained from the riverbank at the Pontus St. Angelo straight up to the facade of the cathedral, a great needed improvement which would really embellish Rome. Now that was an interesting idea. Next image, please. Oh, here's the letter, of course, that Gail found in the archive and passed on to me. I'm eternally grateful, of course. Next one, please. Here's the view uh, as it looked at that point. So you see here the area between St. Peter's and Castellus and Angelo is still the Borgo Nuovo, little streets and squares. But the idea, of course, to open that up was, uh, had been around for quite some time. Uh, in fact, um, Pope Alexander VI already had created the straight street so that the processions uh, were moving along a little swifter. Bramante had uh, developed similar thoughts of opening up this uh, approach. Bernini himself had developed an idea very similar to this and uh, Carlo Fontana and Cosimo Morelli and many others contributed to this idea. So the, we can assume that the idea was somewhat in the air and that maybe Cass Kilbert uh, had picked up the discussion surrounding it on one of his many trips to Rome. But he spoke, of course, with the voice of a foreign authority, and his influence should not be underestimated. In fact, in August 1926, the architect Glenn Brown reported in the architectural record about Cass Gilbert's letter and his proposal to build the connecting street instead of the skyscraper. And I quote from the architectural record, nothing was heard from the letter for some time. Recently, a distinguished Italian who was visiting this country informed a friend of the fine arts that Mussolini in directing the development of the city improvements gave the officials a letter from a New York architect with instructions to follow its suggestions. If the suggestions of Gilbert have prevented the skyscraper in Rome and will open a view from the bridge of St. Angelo to St. Peter's, he will have performed an international service to art, a service worthy of his new dignity as president of the National Academy of Design. Gilbert had just been elected to be president of the National Academy of Design. It should be noted though that the author of this article that I just quoted, Glenn Brown, he had been secretary of the AA in Washington for many years and he was a close friend of Cass Gilbert's. The, the fawning article that we just heard was in all likelihood instigated by uh, Cass Gilbert himself. Half a year later, next image please, Cass Gilbert is back in Rome and he had written to ask for an audience with Mussolini himself. They meet for the first time. Mussolini had agreed to meet him and Gilbert, uh, Gilbert describes the audience, the meeting with Mussolini on May 18, 1927 in great detail in his diary. He had in his pocket a copy of the letter he had written about the tower uh, to the Duce um, and uh, he was very fascinated as we've heard and immensely impressed with the Italian dictator. At the be beginning and end of the short meeting the Duce raises his right arm for the fascist greeting and in a rush of emotion Gilbert returns it. He writes in his diary, it is the most dignified, the most natural, the most graceful, and the most noble salutation I know. The conversation is short. Gilbert shows to Mussolini some of his recent work, and Mussolini compliments him on it. The letter is in his pocket. He's about to take it out, and Mussolini says, the Duce confesses to him, I would love to live in a skyscraper. <laughs> At that very moment, Gilbert does not have the courage to bring up the issue of Palanti's Tower for the heart of Rome. And he is complimented out a few seconds later. The uh, meeting is over. He has left Mussolini's office, and he talks to the translator, somewhat dismayed that he didn't have the courage to bring up the issue that was so important to him. And Miss Lillian Gibson, the translator, uh, takes a copy of the letter and promises to him that she would uh, remind the Duce of the letter when they have the next English lesson. She was uh, teaching English to the Duce uh, uh, every week and so she promises him to take care of this. Uh, quickly, um, uh, in the meantime, back to t t Palanti. He had gone back to uh, um, uh, Buenos Aires 
but he had, uh, of course, heard a little bit about the international criticism, and he wants to return to Mussolini, who had obviously expressed great interest in the tower, and he prepares a little book with his designs and also further thoughts on the tower. And this little book is quite important because uh, it contains the design of the tower with some alternatives, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, it is the first book ever uh, printed uh, in an, under an Italian imprint by an Italian publisher, the first publication ever under the title, under the name Rizzoli. It's a company that still exists today here in New York. And that was their first ever book. So uh, just very quickly, he uh, revises his design, makes it a little more streamlined. And uh, uh, let's look at the next uh, uh, streamlined. He explains, in fact, that he feels his tower would complete the triad of St. Peter's, the Vittorio Manuela monument, and then this monument to fascism. He also proposes a new position up there near the railroad station in this uh, uh, circle there uh, in the Castro Pittorio. And uh, the next one, please. And he suggests a number of alter, um, alternates and, and improvements here on the right. is a, a s slender, more slimmed down, more uh, contemporary tower with a smaller footprint. Next one, please. And uh, he obviously uh, took some lessons from Hugh Ferris's drawings, which had appeared in the meantime. And uh, he also feels that he should really brace himself for the international criticism. And so he had provided the uh, first uh, tower, uh, next one, first tower, which was 330 meters high, and now provided an alternative, which was slightly lower, 300 meters. And then he went a little further, just to make sure, uh, 145 meters, and finally a fourth version. Uh, the uh, rather, <laughs> rather deflated symbol of the uh, fascist revolution, as you can see. And so, but at the same time, Mussolini became more and more unavailable. Palanti tried everything to have another meeting and show him what he had done in the meantime, and Mussolini was not interested anymore, it seemed. Palanti gave more money for another scholarship for architecture students. He brought a whole black stallion from uh, South America to give to the Duce, and nothing helped. And uh, instead, uh, the Duce, in fact, had changed somewhat direction in his urban planning. He had uh, started to collaborate with a man called Marcello Piacentini. Uh, next image, please. And, in fact, had uh, announced great plans to do something quite similar to what Gilbert had proposed to him, namely to create axes, visual axes, to liberate the monuments. Next one, please. The, uh, both the antique monuments, the Pantheon, Marcello's Theater, the Capitol, but also those of Christian Rome, and in fact, free them from the debris, as he called it, of the past, and make them visual. So there is a certain uh, similarity, and Piacentini, who took the position that Palanti had hoped for for himself, next one, uh, please, uh, Piacentini, in fact, is the main uh, person to direct these efforts. Here is Mussolini, in fact, opening the Via dell'Impero, that many of you are familiar with, one of those uh, uh, sventramenti, those openings that are uh, the, the sort of key of his, uh, next one please, of his urban policy. And of course, he goes to work with Piacentini to indeed what, uh, uh, realize what Gilbert had proposed, namely to build a street from the Castello San Angelo to St. Peter's. They begin the preparation. Of course, the Lateran treaties have to be written and signed first, which happens in 29, and then they finally have access to this piece of road. And then in the 30s, Piacentini and, and uh, Spaccatini begin, uh, uh, to, Spaccarelli rather, begin to open up the street. It takes until 58, until the street, as we all know it today, is finished. Please, the next uh, slide. Here it is, of course. We all know the access. And the next one, please. I wanted to just uh, uh, say that Palanti never built anything again. He uh, kept up his hopes to get another commission uh, by the fascist government, entered competitions like this one here for the Palazzo Littorio, the title obviously reminding of his tower, and was laughed out of the competition by his Italian uh, colleagues. Uh, he, uh, next one, on his own, he published a book with the tower, the Torre Littoria for Milan, and continued designing hundreds and hundreds of buildings, publishing, th uh, pu pu publishing them, uh, next one, please, uh, until he died, a bitter old man, as I heard from his family, whom I visited in Milan in 1978, and kept producing hundreds and hundreds of more designs, and uh, next one, please, even a little brick that he hoped would uh, uh, conquer the world, he called it Palandomus here, uh, um, so it's a rather uh, sad and strange uh, story. I wanted to just end now, uh, next image, uh, please, with a very short epilogue. When the American troops entered Berlin after, at the end of the uh, Second World War, in Hitler's bunker, they found a little book, uh, namely Palanti's 
book that he had sent dedicated to the Dottore, as he wrote, Dottore Adolfo Hitler, with great uh, admiration. He had hoped that Hitler might build the tower instead of Mussolini, uh, which uh, obviously he did not do quite the contrary. In fact, uh, Hitler forbid every, uh, um, every um, uh, high-rise building. Uh, in Germany shortly after he received that book. That, this is the only high-rise design that was ever designed for the, for the fascists in, or the Nazis in Germany with uh, an entirely uh, different outlook. I also wanted to, just a uh, next uh, uh, slide please, uh, quickly remind you something interesting happened in Rome. Uh, obviously I don't think that he sent it to uh, Stalin as well, you know, that would have been ideologically too much of a gulf, but uh, something interesting happened. Uh, uh, there was a competition held in uh, Russia in the early 30s for a palace of the Soviets and it was won by a man called Boris Yofan. And interestingly Boris Yofan had studied in Rome worked with a man called Armando Brasini, had uh, been there at exactly the moment when uh, Palanti presented his project uh, twice. Um, and there are certain similarities both in the layout, the multifunctionality and the section of this tower that of course remind us of Palanti's uh, project. And of course this one too, next one uh, please, was, uh, went through a number of different versions, smaller and smaller and smaller and in the end was also abandoned. But uh, of course the central idea and I believe with it a little bit of the Woolworth Tower, which was the inspiration for Palantis Tower, still lives on in those towers such as the Lomonosov University in Moscow. So a little bit of the Woolworth building has traveled through all these uh, stages. Thank you very much.